This is our uh, final session, our closing session. Uh, my name is Eric Collins, uh, I'm the Economic Development Director for Montgomery County, and certainly Montgomery County is uh, pleased to be uh, a sponsor uh, again this year for the uh, for the Economic Development Summit. Uh, today, I'm pleased to to introduce Tracy Hyatt Bosman, who's the Managing Director of uh, Biggins, Lacey, Shapiro and Company based out of Chicago. Uh, we're very fortunate to have her here. Tracy, actually it's her first time here in Dayton, right? Yes, it is. And we're a great place, right Hi, Mitch? Anthony. Great place, great place. Wait, 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 wait. What are we all gonna say when somebody says, what's Dayton like? It doesn't, it doesn't suck, suck here, here, right? right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> We had to weave that in. <laughs> Mitch, you were great. You were great. You were great. And on Grace's side, the rule is if you lick it, it's yours for 24 hours. So I'm going to lick every place in Dayton. Oh, gosh. Hey, moving on. Moving on. <laughs> moving on. So, really, uh, I'm really excited about Tracy, uh, Tracy being here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we, we're very fortunate. Yeah, no, I, I <laughs> that's the beauty about Dayton. See how we're a big, happy family, right? right? So my flight, my flight just got moved up. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm gonna have to run. So, so really, uh, very happy for her to be here. I mean, she, Tracy, uh, is among you know one of the, the site selectors guild, which is a very exclusive. Uh, group of uh, site selectors in the nation, and uh, Tracy uh, and their and their their organizations. Really, it's one of the top 50. Uh, and Tracy was recognized uh, not too long ago about being one of the top one of the top site selectors in the country. So to have her here is a is a really big deal for our for our community. Uh, Tracy uh, is going to talk about and kind of reinforce some, some things that all of us, many of us already know about economic development, working with site selectors, but she's also going to talk about some of the trends, things that we may not know that we need to start factoring in as we do our day-to-day -day, uh, business uh, in economic development. And just a little bit about Tracy. Uh, Tracy has 20 years of experience uh, in in, prof in economic development across. Doesn't look like a day over eight, right? Right, that's right. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, in economic development, she's worked uh, in the public sector, of course, now in the private sector. She worked for the state of South Carolina um, and has done a lot of a, a lot of big deals. Uh, uh, in her old position in South Carolina, and it certainly is a major uh, factor when she's working with uh, companies, her clients uh, uh, in the private sector as they make site selection uh, decisions. Uh, also, she used to work with uh, Grubb and Ellis, uh, where she was co-leader of the Clean Energy Practice Group uh, for Grubb and Ellis and a member of the National Data Center Practice Group. Uh, she's an experienced economic developer, as I said. Uh, she has, uh, having worked as vice president of policy and operations for the Chicago area Lake County uh, partners, uh, and then senior senior manager of prospect activities, as I mentioned in South Carolina. So that was a big thing. And by the way, South Carolina, you know, if you talk to a lot of folks around the country, South Carolina has been uh, very successful course Ohio as well but South Carolina is doing a great job so if you speak to folks in North Carolina they recognize that South Carolina is uh, kicking some tail so but with that I'd like to introduce Tracy and uh, at the end uh, we'll, we'll leave it open for some questions and answers so with that yeah. Tracy great thank you So I didn't actually think you guys would stick around, so I didn't prepare any comments. Any questions? <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, right. I'm that speaker, yes, I know. I'm well aware. Um, thank you for the introduction. I have to say it reminded me, your comments, along with Mitch's unfortunate comment, um, <laughs> Reminded, <laughs> it reminded me of an introduction, the first introduction I had as a consultant. Um, and I was speaking to economic developers and economic developers in the Chicago area with whom I had recently been interacting as an economic developer. So I was already a bit nervous about this new role. And the gentleman in introducing me was sharing that I attended the University of South Carolina. And he turned to me and he said, that's right, Tracy, go 
So any of you that know anything about the University of South Carolina know that our, our mascot is a Gamecock, but we shorten it. We say go, yeah. And so I'm looking at his deer in the headlights look thinking, I'm in Chicago, I can't say that. That's not right. And he's looking at me like, don't you know who your mascot is? You know, but then we've now, he's introduced me several more times and, and he actually went to um, a school where the mascot was the hose. So you can imagine, we have this whole routine worked out now. Um, so in, you know, in um, comparison, Mitch's comment was actually fairly tame for, for some of the ways I, I've been introduced. On that note, <laughs> um, here's what I'd like to talk to you a little bit today, uh, about today. So we're going to do a few warm-up activities, and that's going to include, I'd like you to shout out some of the aha moments, besides it doesn't suck here today, um, that you've had. Not yet. Wait for it. I'm giving you about two minutes' notice to think about it. Um, if you don't have an aha moment, maybe, in keeping with Mitch's lunchtime comments, yell out something that you learned in one of the presentations today that you didn't know about the region that you can now go out and sell. And Mitch didn't even ask me to say that, so okay? Um, but be thinking about that. We'll come right back to it. Let me give you a quick company overview of, of BLS. Um, I'm not selling to any of you. You're not my clients, but that'll tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from. We'll talk about um, the location selection process. I think most of you do this on a day-to-day -day basis in some form, but it, it will be a little bit of a warm-up to, um, again, the context for my comments. Um, then we'll go right into the location selection trends. We'll touch on what Trump's administration may or may not mean for trends in location. Um, talk some about incentives. I'm not going to duplicate what was talked about earlier today, um, but take that from a little different angle, and then we'll do q and I'm also going to absolutely encourage you that if you have a question about something I'm talking about, please interrupt. Um, and and we'll take some Q&A at the end, but we'll take it as we go to. Just yell out the question nice and loud. Um, if you see that your question fits better in the later section, please hold it, okay? But otherwise, we'll take it as we go. All right, so the first of the warm-up activities, yell out an aha moment or something you learned today about Dayton. We need truckers. We need truckers. That's true across the country. You're not alone in that. If you can demonstrate um, unique solutions to that, that's a great selling point for the distribution facilities and the manufacturing facilities. I would take it back on that and say the legislative process underway to help get those truckers, which was uh, teaching the guidance counselors in the schools to modify their thinking, to um, offer financial incentives and or assistance to those pursuing a CDL to become a truck driver and uh, also minimize or uh, reducing the age requirements for insurance to be able to become a truck driver. Now this is the part where I repeat what you said because you're not miked. <laughs> the legislative efforts around this in encouraging guidance counselors to talk to their students about things and financial assistance. I, I I know you didn't. I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> but that there's, there's, there's work to be done there, right? Three ahas, right? Three ahas, yep. Let's get one more before we move on. The assault on incentives is winning in Florida. The assault on incentives is winning in Florida. That is true. That is good for you. <laughs> um, yeah, no, they, we've, we've actually been spending a good bit of time with Florida um, trying to talk the local developers off the edge um, and uh, that sort of thing. So you're, you're absolutely right about that. Okay, um, I promised I'd be very quick about this. Um, we don't even need to talk about that firm. That, we're based in Princeton. We have offices in New York. I'm in Chicago. We have an office in Cleveland. Uh, we work with all kinds of industries. We don't do retail storefront. We do everything else. Um, yeah, that's that slide. This just shows the different areas we work in. I think one of the things that makes us a little unique compared to other 
site selection firms is the in-house utility capabilities that we have. We have a team of, of economic developers like Dennis. Is Dennis still here? Right there. We've got people like Dennis. <laughs> Never leave, because they might talk about you, right? <laughs> um, so we have some, uh, we have some dentists in-house um, to help us do our due diligence and work with the utilities and assessing sites and due diligence and that sort of thing. That is why I always use a bottle with a top. Um, OK, so that is it for the company introduction. How many of you are sick of this chart, see it too much, every presentation you've ever been to? If you don't raise your hand, I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> All right. Um, if, if you haven't seen it, this is a very, every site selection consultant has a chart that looks like this. And it just shows you, gets you thinking about the process, because we're taking a lot of locations. And we are trying to use data to bring it down to a few locations. You'll notice I put Dayton in there. Was that good or was that good? OK. All right. Um, some of the things we're looking at, um, not surprising. Um, we're going to do another one. We're going to bring it down even further. We're going to look at some other things that, you know, what we do is we start with the data that is really easy to get, that we can download, the demographic data, that sort of thing. We make our cuts. And as we get smaller and smaller, then we start to add in the data that is harder to get to, utility rates, permitting speeds. Um, available real estate, that sort of thing. So um, I will tell you that everything I've described about the process is the way it works on paper. I've yet to have a project actually unfold nice and neatly like that, but that's the general concept. These are some of the factors that we look at. Um, I'm not going to spend time talking about them. Um, I am going to come back to right to work. Um, and obviously, I'm coming back to incentives. Quality of life is one that, that Mitch mentioned. Um, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll touch on that in a few minutes, too. Beyond those, are there, one, are there terms up here that you don't understand, or you're not sure what I'm referencing? Going once, going twice. What's that? Air connectivity. Air connectivity. That means, do you have an airport? Can I get from point A to point B, hopefully without a connection? Um, I flew in from Chicago direct, so that's good. Um, I actually, off the top of my head, couldn't tell you about the availability of international direct flights. You're probably going to Cincinnati for that, um, which, is, which is fine, by the way, for an international flight. You have, if you have that around, and I, and I know even that's going to be somewhat limited. But um, air connectivity, when I came over to the dark side, this was the one that really hit me. I, I knew it would apply to headquarters, right? But I've been surprised how many projects have this as one of the material, material constraints, because they either want to move their management team in and out, or they want to move customers in and out, manufacturing facilities. Distribution facilities, it's, it's really interesting. So um, Eric and Mike showed me um, around the airport a bit and got to meet the, is this title director? Director, um, so you are obviously focused on that as an asset, um, and that, that's super. Um, so time zones typically come into play if you have a call center and they need, they want to be open um, to answer calls for the West Coast, um, particularly, it also applies for companies that have European or Asian operations that they're trying to sync up with. So if I'm really Asian, if I'm looking that way, it's good to be in the West Coast time, the Pacific time zone, because I can connect during their business hours. Um, if, it's, if it's something that's purely looking at the U.S. and it's not worried about the call center you know, aspect too much, then it really doesn't. Manufacturers don't really care. Any others up there? It is, yeah, right. Um, um, it, it is usually natural disaster. 
um, when we're working a data center project um, or something else that's considered <coughs> for whatever reason mission critical, um, we'll also be looking at surrounding uses, whether it's chemical facilities, um, you know, flight paths. Um, you don't want to be in a flight path for your data center. You don't want to be near a railroad line if something might catch fire, um, that sort of thing. It's usually a natural disaster, though. All right, well, if, if you want to come back to any of them, any of them later on, just we'll take that during the Q&A. This makes my job look so nice and simple. Um, but if I put the actual spreadsheet up here, um, even Eric wouldn't be able to read it um, from, from the first row, second row. Um, but this just gives you a sense, again, of the, the process, right? So we're taking all those factors that you just saw on the past screen, we're assigning weights to them. And by we, I don't mean we BLS. I mean, we are coaching the client through that. Um, we spend a lot of time with the client trying to help them articulate what the relative importance of their site criteria are. Because the cheapest site is never the one with the most labor next to the airport um, with rail access and deep water port access and no natural disasters and you know all of that. So um, we have to help them start to articulate what's more important and, and where do we want to put the emphasis because we then apply the weightings to the, the scores of the data that we just saw and it ends up looking something like this. Again, it's like, you know, spreadsheets, they don't even fit on the computer screens, but um, it just gives you a sense, right? So it's, it's weighting, it's scores, it's filters. Um, sometimes it, if something is just a a go, no-go type of thing. Uh, it's a baseline criteria, then the company or the com communities never make it into that funnel analysis that you saw. They get pulled out before they ever get there. Um, but then the rest is um, scored and weighted. And we end up with a, a list, location A, B, C, D, goes out for however long. And then we move into field visits. And that's usually about the first time you hear from us. You may have heard about, you may have heard from us as we get towards the end of that screening process, but these days we can do so much of it desktop, um, desktop that we don't really have to reach out terribly early in the process. Um, okay, so any questions about process? Yes. Great question. Um, I don't get demographic data from your website. Um, most site selection consultants won't. Don't take it down, though, because the generally accepted statistic is that about 50 to 60 percent of the projects that are out there are, are run by misguided companies that don't know they need a consultant working with them, right? So they don't have the databases that we're pulling from. So they're going to go out to your websites and they're going to be pulling. So you have multiple audiences, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Um, we were talking last night on the way to dinner, actually, about um, demographics and particular labor stats for this area. And I was actually learning that a lot of what goes on at the base does not get captured in the workforce statistics. And so that's the kind of thing that unfortunately has to be delivered really on a one-to-one -one basis, one by one, um, so that we know when we're looking at the data, um, it's, it, it's, it may not be telling the whole story. And there, there's other instances out there like that where we know that we have to go in and massage something or, or shepherd it through to the later stages um, by hand. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank okay. You. Any other questions on processes before we get into the trends, what we're seeing? I, I just have a quick question. I kind of thought uh, you did. The demographic question was a good question in your response. Thank you. But in terms of websites in general. More general website. How, how much credence do you, do you put on, on the website? 
Yeah. Excluding the demographic. Right. But. So um, we will go to your website. The primary reason we'll go to your website is to find your name and number if we don't already know you. Um, so that's, that's number one. Um, we will also look on it for incentive information um, because that's not centralized in any database. Um, we will look for top employers, um, layoffs, and we, we know you're not usually going to have that on your website, but um, we like to know where there's available workforce, right? So we're looking for those types of things that are not in a published database. Um, I will say our group is very quick to pick up the phone. The time we're really going to spend time on your website is when it's 2 a.m. and we just think you're probably not in the office anymore. Um, then we'll try to start seeing what we can find on the website to, to hit a deadline, but yeah. I'd say most consultants will answer the same way. Um, real estate, real estate databases is another question we get a lot. Um, do we go to the websites for real estate? 90% of the projects we work have a broker on, on the team as well. Um, maybe we brought the broker in, the broker brought us in, or the client said, hey, you two work together. Um, but so we're usually not the ones identifying the real estate. And if we are, um, I'm going to call you because not just him. You know that, right? Everybody that's in a different county, I'll call you too. But, um, but I don't know. You may have a great database that's up to date. But so many of them out there are not up to date, and so I don't know which ones I can trust and which ones I can't, so I call. Yes? Chris, are you going to talk about, because uh, you said that the site selection, you haven't, you haven't taken a site visit yet. So are you going to talk, talk about, about the build. Uh, what makes those four higher ranked properties, which one, how does it get to number one? Nope. Sorry. So, <laughs> You know, I don't have it in the slides. I'm glad you, I, I'm glad you brought it up. So um, when we do, let's take a minute and talk about field work. So when we, when we do field work, we're usually down to three or five locations. And we're going to come in, um, field work maybe one or two or three visits. Um, we'll usually bring company representatives with us. And we're going to be doing a few things. The, the most important thing is we're going to be doing a labor assessment, which means we want to talk to area employers. We want to talk to your workforce development professionals. We want to talk to your placement and temp agencies. Um, and we will have a whole list of questions, and we want to do that several times. We may have done it on the phone some before we even put you on the list for the field visits, but we'll come in. And we can, in certain markets, we have our contacts, and we can you know, reach out to our own contacts within companies that we know are there. But primarily, we're going to be looking to the economic development community to pair us with HR departments, um, CEOs, CFOs, about their experience. So yesterday, we actually took a visit to Graphene, um, Graphene Group, Graphene, anyway. Um, it's the perfect type of visit because it's something exciting. Uh, you have a champion for the region. Um, somebody, too, that was from outside of the region and could talk about his experience, you know, and, and being acclimated to the region, that sort of thing. So we're looking for those kind of contacts in a field visit. Um, we're going to have an opportunity to hear a dog and pony show, for lack of a better term, um, from the community, from the state, about what's good about the region. We're going to be talking about incentives, that's usually about the first time that we really start to get into some of the details about what might be available. We'll do a site visit. If it is a manufacturing, sorry, a real estate tour is usually involved with that. Um, if, we're, if it's a manufacturing or distribution facility, something that has infrastructure requirements, we may be asking to meet with the water, sewer, electric, comp electric company for sure um, in those situations. And just kind of getting a sense for the area. Um, we don't want to meet political uh, representatives at that point. Um, there's, there's always exceptions, right? But, but generally, um, you know, that's what we're trying to focus on. We'll probably come back in um, with a bigger client team uh, to do additional visits. 
we may come back in with our utility team to do additional due diligence. But what really sets the, the field visits apart, one, the, the real estate and all of the operational pieces have to work. You can't come out and find that, oh, there's a road somebody built through the middle of the site that I was interested in, right? So as long as all that checks out, then what really matters is did we, or more importantly, the client, leave with a feeling that that community understood them? Did the employer visits indicate that there was good labor force in the area, that the corporate world is well connected in the area and cooperates together, that there's common initiatives, common places where they come together to pursue certain you know, reforms and that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, did, did, you, did you get them? So um, one, of the, um, one of the best examples is really a little bit far out there, I guess, but we, um, and this is, this is actually a Grubb and Ellis project. This goes back before I was at BLS, but we had one client that was um, very um, focused on finding markets where there was a creative culture. It wasn't quite like Michael Porter's description, but it was a little different. Um, but definitely very diverse, very inclusive. Um, and we had managed to talk them into visiting Nashville. And they, the, the San Francisco-based company, they could not believe they were going to Nashville in the middle of the Bible Belt um, when you know, they were looking for more of that San Francisco type of environment. And so Nashville was very well attuned to this. Um, there happened to be, and I can never remember who it is, but um, there was a performer in town that night that is very well known in the LGBT community. Um, and they managed, at the, the day of, they noticed that the client team was very interested in that performer, and they managed to score like third row tickets to the concert that night. And um, that project did go to Nashville. And it wasn't, wasn't because they got concert tickets, but be, it was because they changed that company's perception of what the community was. And they, they came off, you know, demonstrating that they were inclusive. And it, it really did make the project for them. So those little things, you can't plan them, but that's what you, you want to be attuned to, is what, what the client is really watching for. Okay, trends. These trends, by the way, are really, they're not in any order. They're kind of all over the place. And we'll, we'll hit on them. You can slow me down. We'll keep going. But the one that, that um, really comes to mind first for me is reshoring and FDI. Um, you guys, are you guys seeing that here? So we're seeing um, the reshoring has a lot to do with the change that has occurred in the last 10, 15 years um, in the price parity between Chinese labor and, and the um, Asian labor in general, but particularly China um, and the U.S. And, and that labor that used to be so much cheaper is now still cheaper, but it's only a little cheaper. And when we add in the transportation costs, the time lost at sea, the fact that if you make chairs and you're stocking the stores in the U.S. with red chairs and suddenly blue chairs become popular, you have to wait three months for it to get here from China. How many sales have you lost? Um, so there's a, a group called the Reshoring Initiative. I don't have, have you guys familiar with that? It's, um, it's really it's a bit of a think tank, um, but they, if you go to the website for the Reshoring Initiative, there's a, a total cost calculator there. And it's really a tool that I think you have to sign up, you know, but it's free and you won't get any more emails. So if you want to register, you can play around with it. But it's a, it's a tool that's designed to help companies walk through these, these analyses. Say, so, okay, well, it may be cheaper to make the widget in China, but let's look at the total cost. So it asks about, you know, lost sales. It asks about time um, at sea. It talks about quality pro um, problems or R&D issues, et cetera, and it, it really gives companies a full sense of, of what it costs to be supplying the U.S. market from somewhere else. And it, not just that, 
you know, calculator, but that conversation has really taken hold in the corporate world. And so we're seeing a lot of rethinking um, in that regard. So the, the other thing I think that is driving it is the stability of the US market. We may not feel very stable right now, but compared to other markets, we are. And the more uncertainty there is in the world, um, the more we see capital flight to the US. So we saw it with Brexit. We were tracking the currency um, movement with Brexit. The US, the dollar went up. It, it, it shot up with Brexit, not because we had anything to do, you know, not that it was going to change a lot of trade flows between the U.S. and Britain or the, even the U.S. And, and the European Union, but because it's a safe haven, right? So it's the more uncertainty again. And Mexico, by the way, dropped. And you're thinking, what, Mexico doesn't have anything to do with Brexit. But again, capital flight to the most stable markets, and we continue to see that um, in the U.S. So companies are feeling better about having the investment here. And of course we have, are we the most powerful consumer, biggest consumer market? Probably depends on how you slice it, but certainly why, that, that's a bit driving reason why people want to be here. So manufacturing uptick. I think we, I mean, I'm going to assume you guys are seeing that because you've been talking about it all day. Um, is that right? So we're seeing a rebirth of, of manufacturing doesn't look like it used to, but how many of us knew that was going to happen, right? Oh, come on, I thought this region felt pretty good about that, right? So you're, you're vindicated in hanging on to, to that manufacturing tradition. Um, automation, obviously, that's what makes it look different. That's also what makes it possible, because now we don't need hundreds of people to do it at a higher wage rate. We need fewer people and some robots, but now we, can, now we can hire those people to do that. And by the way, we can also hire some people to build those robots that the, that the manufacturers, I guess the manufacturing supply and the manufacturing, but, but you see what I'm saying. Skilled labor, just had a whole session on that right before this. This is an issue. Um, it is hard to find because the baby boomers are re, uh, retiring. It is hard to find because Manufacturing was on the decline for so long that we have quit training people um, to the extent that we were in these fields. So that's a, you know, another cause for the skills gap. But we're filling it. This is one of the trends I see is economic development communities or, or, or professionals are talking to us more and more about apprenticeship programs in their, in their communities. Um, German style um, a lot of times. But this is how we're starting to fill that skills gap. And I heard something very encouraging in the workforce session before this too, and that was that one of the, I believe it's one of the equipment suppliers ha in this region has a training program for mechatronics, a certification program. Mechatronics is that combination of, of mechanical and, and electronics is one of the things that we hear um, employers talking about the most. They say, we can't find that here in the US. There's nobody that knows how to bring those two fields together. So that's super that you have that resource here in the area. I want you to go out and tell a stranger about that, OK? So <laughs> if you did not hear Mitch at lunch, you have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, so the God, I'm so tired of talking about millennials. You guys tired of talking about millennials? Raise your hand if you're a millennial. <laughs> we are tired of talking about you. They said Generation X was the main, um, the main, uh, what's the word I want? What? Demographic. Demographic in the workforce for nine months. <laughs> that was a great nine months, wasn't it, guys? We had a great run. Had a great run. All right, millennials are going to be there for like 20 years. Great. So, but companies are looking at this. Now, let's go back to what Mitch was saying about quality of life. I don't want to, wait, he said quality of life matters, right? And I said it does. And in the back of my head, I'm screaming, but don't tell me about your opera house. Don't tell me about the number of golf courses you have. It's not like that anymore. So before quality of life meant, do you have the quality of life 
that we can use to attract the C-suite to your community. That's what we were looking for, and we're not looking for that anymore. The C-suite goes where the millennials go. Don't tell the millennials they'll get a big head. Um, but what we're looking for now is a quality of life that applies to the millennials. That last session on Dayton downtown, huge. So glad you're talking about that because you can't get away from that. The, the center city of any metropolitan area is the first place people are judging, are you a good place for millennials? And it, it's, it's great if the millennials are already there. We're looking at that, but we're also looking at will they come? Because they do move places and then look for a job. Okay, and <laughs> I was at this one session, we're talking and you know, we're, we're all laughing, all the Gen Xers and the baby boomers are saying, yeah, those millennials, they go somewhere and then they go, oh, I need a job, you know? And, uh, and, and how silly that they do that. And, and finally, the one token millennial we had in that conversation looks at us, he said, okay, okay, I, I get what you're saying, I, I see your point of view. But for us, we're thinking, you would leave your family where you like to live, you know, all the things you've ever known, and you would go somewhere just for a job. And we're all kind of like, oh. You know, when you look at it that way, you kind of see, see that point of view too. But that's, that's the culture that we're living in now. That's, companies are aware of that. So they're trying to track what's going to be attractive to millennials because that's where I need to be. You can also look at the demographics. And like I said, Generation X, you know, dominant workforce. It's, the baby boomers are going off. The millennials are what they need to fill that. So especially in these tight labor markets, they have to be sensitive to this. Shorter lead times. This is where I drive you guys nuts. Because I call and I say, we need this in a week or two. And I'm the nice consultant. I know other consultants that don't give you that long, right? Um, it's our clients. <laughs> it's our clients' fault. Um, but it is because what they're doing is we've seen through this whole great recession they're sitting on a ton of money we know that that we know that they've got money but they're not spending it and then they're waiting till the last second where they simply are bursting at the seams in their other facilities um, their contracts are coming in too fast they have to have the space now and so they're really we spend so much time right now trying to figure out how to condense our own timelines to keep up with them. We had one call just this morning where the client says, yeah, we need to make a decision and be able to announce it to our, our workforce on June 12th. And we're like, and you're starting the project this morning. Okay. That's, that's what we're all up against. Um, presence of private equity. Are you guys seeing this? Maybe not as much. Um, we're finding that a lot of our clients are backed by private equity. And that the private equity is, is visible in the strategy because they're trying to reposition that company for the exit. So they're really focused on incentives, for one thing, because that's that cash flow that they're trying to get going. Um, but it, it really is just a little bit of a different dynamic. It's, it's very different than if you have a publicly traded company or family. They're, they're hot button, their hot buttons are different. Um, so just something to to be alert to. Buildings are in short supply. We talk, they were talking about that in the real estate session earlier today. Um, it's hard to, to find buildings that don't have hair on them, and even those are getting, getting attention. Um, so that's not what I meant. Actually, this is exactly what we meant, because the industrial product that most places have right now, it's the ceiling height that's the problem. So we, most of our clients are looking for 30 plus. They can sometimes deal with 28, 26 if they're getting desperate. Anything under that, they just, just tear it down because you can't raise, they're saying tear it down, I'm not telling you to tear it down, but they can't, you, they can't raise the roof, right? That's, you can do other things to the building, but you can't raise, you can raise the roof, I'm dancing, but um, <laughs> so this, it, so your short supply here, this is a problem across the country, you're not alone, but it, it gives you an opportunity if you can get spec in the ground 
If you can get somebody to build that spec, if you can't get the private, do you have public means of doing this? It's a hook. You may not build the exact right building for the client that is looking, but if you can get close enough that they at least come to the market, maybe you can convince them that you're worth waiting while you build something else up from a pad or a shell. Are you seeing any trends like 200,000, 400,000? Is there a number that you see? And do you see a lot of multi-tenant types of specs? <sighs> Box that yeah. can be demised? Um, Dem something that can be demised is okay for some clients. A lot of clients don't want the extra headache, but it certainly makes it easier to get it out of the ground, right? Um, and the more desperate a company is for the real estate, the more tolerant they become of things that aren't perfect. But it's interesting you should ask what we're seeing across the board because it does change, I think, from market to market. and product to product, but I just happen to have these great statistics, Eric actually didn't know this, um, from the Dayton Development Coalition about what they're seeing, because if you're trying to figure out what you need in the market, it's based on what the searches you're seeing, right? So out of 39 leads, 20 were looking for buildings, and another six were, could look at buildings or land. Um, average building size that was being searched for, 170,000 square feet. That's big for a spec, although there's a million square foot spec going in um, near the airport. So <laughs> something like that. Um, it's big for a spec, but I'd say most of our clients are, tend to be looking even a little bigger. Um, smallest building size that was being looked for was 18, largest 1.2, average ceiling height 28. I'd say go 30, go 30 or above because it just, the way they're racking the distribution piece of it, that, or if they need overhead cranes, that's where they need this, this clearance. Average time to respond, 5.5 days. I love, so Eric, um, Mitch gave me this, these stats last night when I asked for them, but I love, he gave me the average lead time, and then there's this little thing off to the side that said, and it's not even business days. You know, this includes weekends. So again, going back to that, um, that lead time. Regionalism, I'm so glad you guys are doing this as a region. This is really one, this is my soapbox that I talk about every chance I get. And let me show you why. There are 3,100 counties in the U.S., 381 U.S. MSAs, 160 Canadian cities, 50 states, 10 provinces, plus 193 other countries. That's 3,894 entities. Your average site selection consultant will spend about two hours a week doing some form of meeting, fam, you know, whatever it is, but trying to hear about your community. 52 weeks a year, that gives me 104 hours a year to talk to this many entities. So what do we do? We prioritize regions and states and countries, but um, that's where we're prioritizing. So if you call us, and no offense, you've called us and say, I'm Montgomery County, can I have an hour of your time? Whereas if you call and say Dayton Development Coalition or the region is coming in with several counties and this and that, that's the meeting I'd rather have. Not just because of the time. He knows, I mean, I'm not offending him in any way. But not just because of the time, but because you give us a better picture of what's going on in your community. This was really sold to me once where Indiana has a lot of economic developers, I'm just telling you. They, and they're close to Chicago, so we see them a lot. And I was in a room with a group of them representing a region. I knew every one of them individually. And I thought that they were all in what must be pretty nice, but small, maybe insignificant communities. And when they put themselves around the table and were able to demonstrate that the military base was next to the new interstate that was next to that really cool training initiative that they had going on, and just, you know, all around, it was like, I got it, okay, now I understand what's cool about your region. So you have to do this at a regional basis. And I could give you about 24 other excellent um, examples. How are we doing on time? I don't have a way to. You don't know how much time I have. It's 7 o'clock. OK, all right. Oh, yeah, there's my doesn't equal. I'm sure this is like, you know, like, I don't want to talk about this. Let's talk about just real quick. Right to work, 
Red dots are states that have gone right to, does everybody know what right to work is? It's okay to say you don't. Okay, I'm not saying, okay, I'm gonna keep going then. Right to work, um, those six states have gone since 2012. Makes Illinois feel a little uncomfortable, especially when Michigan goes right to work, right? Um, Ohio, you're, you've got the other guys off the other side that give you a little bit of, of breathing room, right? Um, but this is something that clients look at. And I, remember I talked about filters and I talked about scores. Right to work is something that a lot of clients want to use as a filter. So if it's not a right work to state, manufacturing um, almost always does this. Um, we actually try to tell them don't use it as a filter. If you want to score it, fine. But even for what they're trying to accomplish, which is to be, to have the, the freedom to you know, run their business without what they consider to be the interference of a union, that, that's not the right way to judge it. Um, what's the right way to judge it is to look at union election activity in an area. That's hard to do if you're looking at 10 states to really drill down and see that. We try to get them to wait till we're at more of a short list, but they will still use. I had, I had a, a, a um, office user once use it as a hard and fast criteria. Nobody in their industry had ever been unionized. But for them and for so many, it's a, it's a bellwether of the business friendliness. And we can't talk some of them off of it. So just be aware of that. Um, there is, I'll give you one argument you can use. It's actually compliments of the state of Kentucky. It's one that they used to use. They don't need it anymore. But they had had some research done that showed that you are more likely to become unionized in a right to work state. And the reason for that is if I'm in a right to work state, I'm the worker, I'm deciding whether to vote for the union, I might like to think that they're out there advocating for my rights and trying to get my wages up, don't really want to pay union dues. If I'm in a right to work state, I can vote in favor of the union and then choose not to join. So there's a little bit of statistics there. It's not really intuitive, you have to think it through, but if it helps you, <laughs> if it helps you, feel free to use it and thank Kentucky for it. Um, seriously, how much time do I have? Five minutes. All right. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this then because it'll probably change tomorrow, right? So, um, so just, but let me hit the highlights of, of what I think are some of the things that our clients are looking for. So you talk about the trade inf infrastructure, the trade um, structure is really the word I want, um, in general. So we've got the whole question about NAFTA. Now, Trump has backed off NAFTA to the extent, we don't think he's going to just walk away from it. He's talking about improving it. So this has really changed since the administration walked in. But NAFTA plus the withdrawal from the TPP and some of the other rhetoric has companies worried about, I mean, you think about a manufacturer, their whole supply chain is set up around a stable tariff structure. And the products that are moving back and forth, particularly across the Mexican-US border, that you look and you guys know automotive, so you know they, they put a piece on here, they move it across, they do that, they, they're doing this. If you put up a, a wall and, and you don't let those products go back and forth, you've created a major disruption. And we know that companies are thinking about this. European companies are thinking, maybe I need to build it in the US. Okay, in some regards, that's good, right, for site selection. We make, you know, you get some, uh, get some shifts, you can capture a piece of the pie. Um, that, but, so this is, this is one of the things that we're seeing people think about in response to the administration. The other side of it um, is you have some communities that are very dependent on export markets, uh, exporting. They're a little nervous about that. They might be a lot nervous, but, um, this, is an in, this map shows the darker the color, the more tied to exporting the community is. And there it is by, see Ohio kind of there in the middle 
of, of at least the states that are, to, are, are illustrated here. So that's something else that, I mean, we don't deal with trade, but I mean, trade is part of, of the way the company sets up their, their business and their supply chain. I think we've hit that. Um, so I mean, uh, uh, the businesses in general seem pretty bullish. I heard one person say, as long as we don't get in a war, it's going to be great. <laughs> so, OK. Um, but so you know, the, uh, we do feel like things are, have picked up. We're seeing a ton of activity. Um, and some of it's because people are saying, oh my gosh, he's changing all the rules. We have to be in the US. Let's start looking. Um, are we seeing a ton of that? No, but you know, it's out there, and we're hearing it. Um, carrier deal we don't need to spend a lot of time on. Um, but, but immigration, I think this is another one we have to think about too, right? So companies, we've already said labor force is tight, We're trying to figure out how to, how to tap into labor. Um, it's, it's not so much the undocumented workers um, that are going to be an issue for the client, for the companies that we tend to deal with, you tend to deal with. But if you start limiting the H-1B, H1B visas and, and other types of, of immigration, Companies are really worried about this. And we've got uh, one company we're talking about. Um, it's a foreign company that would like to set up shop here. They don't, their biggest concern, they don't, they don't even want to talk about what, they're like, I don't think we can get our team in. How can we get our team in? You know, and so that's the first thing they want to clear is can they get their C-suite um, immigration visas? Um, that's all going to, I mean, <laughs> I, does, anybody, does anybody know what's going to happen? Because um, I'd like to give you my mic if you do, but um, these, these are the industries that are watching it. Let's just put it that way. So the, these are the ones that when you come across them, they, um, it's worth asking the questions. So they will get copies of this presentation or have access to it. So you can look through. I'm going to just kind of scan through this um, in an effort to get to the trends and incentives, and we'll wrap up there. Um, but some of the reasons that companies, or, or the, the role that incentives are playing for the companies, but then also it's a hook for you to be in the conversation. So some, some uh, thoughts there. Valuation, um, I think the main thing I really want to hit, hit, wanted to hit here, make your incentives scalable. So to the greatest extent that you can. If companies don't know how many jobs they're going to create, they, they say 100, it might be 80, it might be 120. They really like it when that incentive will go up and down with them because they don't have a crystal ball any more than we do. OK, but the, the trend. So we'll, we'll wrap up with this here. Refundability of tax credits. You have that in Ohio. A lot of other places are looking at it. That's the bad news. They're coming for you. So this is where we're seeing a lot of states try to figure out can I make it refundable? Can I make it transferable? Because for so many companies, a tax credit, and we're talking about state level income taxes or, or equivalent, they, they can't use it. So they're, they're getting offered two, three million dollars in, in tax credits and it's worth nothing. So we're seeing states try to find a way to either refund it. If your liability doesn't hit it, we'll give you the money back. Or if we won't give you the money back, you can sell it to your neighbor for 90 cents on the dollar and you're both better off than you were. So that's one trend. Um, targeted data center incentives, you have that here. You have your sales tax. So that's another one that we're seeing. A lot of programs have, um, over the past few years, really have you've built in these wage minimums, right? You have to hit 125% of the county average or the state median or, or whatever it is. And they're good. And I think we all understand that it plays well to say that you're bringing in high paying jobs. Um, but one of the things I've seen, and I'm starting to hear economic developers question it too, is are we limiting ourselves? Are we not able to really incentivize some of the projects we want? Manufacturing is a great example. You can have great jobs. If you're putting them in, especially a little bit more of an affluent area, or something that has maybe one big Boeing facility or something like that, they can't hit it. And, and you're sitting there going, these are jobs we want, but we can't do it. Distribution facilities don't always qualify. And I, you know, like I said, I come out of economic development. I know why we all want to incentivize high paying jobs. 
but you and I and the engineers and, and the IT folks, we can move, we can find other jobs if we, I mean, it's not that simple, but it's really the guy that makes a little over minimum wage that really needs that job. And so I think it's important that we keep the economies balanced and make sure we have those level of jobs too. So a few places are starting to kind of ask questions about maybe we need to do something a little different with our wage minimums. Um, GASB 77, um, new accounting rule, effective the next time the municipality that you're in publishes its financial reports. Instead of just reporting how much property tax they got in, they also have to say this much money was foregone through property tax abatements, incentives, whatever. So they haven't had to publish that piece before. The, the, the issue with that is these financials are going out into the public in, without context. So it sounds like they gave away a sh um, guaranteed <laughs> income. What? <laughs> what? What did I? Oh, yeah, I actually wasn't going to say that. But so they gave away, I sort of say, like assured income, but it's guaranteed income. <laughs> that, that you gave away guaranteed income that um, you, you would have had. And, and, you know, the point the rest of us are going to say is you gave that piece away so you could get the rest of it. And in theory, if you had not given that piece away, you wouldn't have this. But that's going to, that's going to get lost in the translation. So um, we are trying to be extra alert to whether our projects are coming up for public approvals at times when the financials might be coming out for the first time and that the media might be getting hold of it. So something you guys may want to be aware of, too. I really was not going to use that word, I swear. So um, jobs created, contract jobs, jobs created through you know, 3PLs, running your distribution facility, um, work at home. There's, there's a lot of different ways people do jobs now. Um, and we are seeing a, actually maybe a surprising amount of flexibility in some areas for incentives being able to count these jobs, even when it's not you know, the traditional direct job. I think the most interesting one is worker attraction. So starting to hear a few things about, hey, if you go off to school and come back, or you know, there's different ways of structuring it, we're going to give you a tax credit. So now that they're, they're saying, these millennials, you know, they're going to go where they go, we're going to attract the workers and the companies will follow. So very nascent in that area, but I think that's, that's a real shift. Yes. On occasion, on occasion, we're seeing um, some creativity. And it, it, could everybody hear the question? Property tax incentives for spec buildings. The jobs aren't there yet. So we're seeing some creativity, or in some cases, maybe a postponement. So maybe the developer has to float it for the moment, but that when it comes in, when the jobs come in, that it activates. And I feel like I've seen that in Ohio. I feel like Ohio is one of the areas where I've seen some flexibility on that, maybe around Columbus. Okay. Mitch has all the details. <laughs> 